Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for you have sent forth your word. And that word I know is like the rain, which will never return up without touching the ground. Father, we pray this morning that the word that you have sent forth from heaven will perform its works in our lives. Amen. Give us the understanding to catch every detail of the word that you'll be bringing before us today. Lord, help me to speak that that is coming from the throne of heaven and bless every word that will be spoken today. And let there be a quick performance of your word in our lives. Amen. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus. I shared a story on Friday at the vigil. When I came in, I joined at the vigil and I started by sharing a particular story that really touched me when it happened. And I think I will be starting by sharing that story again with us this morning. It was some years ago, I was invited to preach in a parish there in Ibadan and it was supposed to be the final day of the program. They've had it for some days, but I was supposed to preach the last night, the vigil. After the message, normally as we do, we have the prayer section. Then during the prayers, I asked everybody to stand up. If you know you want to sit down, just don't let me see you. Go and sit down where I will not see you. So that people will not lazy during the vigil. So everybody stood up. Then there was this young girl there at the vigil. She has been having a hemorrhage for quite some time. And it was similar to that that we read about in the scriptures. They've been going to the doctors. The parents have done everything. No drug was just working for her. The blood has been flowing and it kept flowing nonstop. So when I asked everybody to stand up, she stood up. But she was tired. So the mother was urging her that please just be strong and pray. Maybe here, God will answer your prayers. Then she told the mother that she was too weak, that she cannot stand. So she left the front seat where they were sitting and went towards the back. But you know, as I was praying, I was moving around like this, moving around like this. So she had to leave like as we are in the tent now. She left the tent of the meeting and went to sit under a shade outside. And as we asked the people to lift up their hands, and ask for the healing power of God to come upon you. Do you know what happened? Where this girl was sitting outside there, she said somebody just touched her. And immediately the hand touched her. She was healed. Do you know that if I saw her when she was going out, eh, I would say unserious person. I said, and this one is expecting to be healed. That is your problem. If you are not healed, it's your problem. Other people are here inside the church standing crying you are going outside to go and sit down if god gave me the power to decide who to heal that he doesn't have a say i'm the one that have a say even if there is extra i won't give her do you know as a preacher the person that left inside the church during prayer not only just at the back she went away from where we are praying and went to sit down there would have looked like a lazy person and an unserious person but she said she was tired. She has been bleeding. And while she was going, Jesus left this place and was following her. You know, that's the way Jesus used to walk. Whenever he wants to perform one great miracle. And he was following her like this and following her and following her. And she went out and Jesus followed her. And they went out. And people were inside the church. They were doing like this. Oh, Lord, touch me. Jesus, Lord. And somebody was going out and Jesus followed the person out and followed her out and followed her out and followed her. Who is the person now? <laughs> Jesus just touched the person like this. You don't get what I'm talking about. I've never been amazed in my life. They waited for about three, four days. Then the mother brought the girl to my parish and said, Father, we have to share this testimony. I'm preaching a message this morning. Help is on the way for your life. Amen. Help is on the way for your life. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know Jesus went out to meet her outside there? 
And then the hand touched her. She knew that the flow of blood had stopped. So she left where she was sitting and was going to the restroom. So when the mother noticed that she was going, the mother stood up and followed her. And she said, Mommy, why the prayer was going on? In fact, the prayer just started. Somebody touched me. You know that song? Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. Somebody touch my Do you know the person? It must be Jesus. It must be Jesus. Jesus has touched my soul. Oh, when I was praying. Praying to the Father, Jesus has touched my So the mother followed her. And she said, Mommy, it has stopped. So they waited the first day, the second day, the third day, until today. Make it bigger for Jesus. I said to the Lord, is that how you do your own thing? There are so many that were sitting in the church and they were still waiting. Some were even rolling on the ground and begging you. And somebody walked out and went to sit down when others were standing. But you went there to meet her. And the Lord said, I will have mercy on whoever I want to have mercy. And I will have compassion on whoever I want to have compassion. And when God wants to have mercy and he wants to show compassion, it does not matter who that person is and what that person has done. It is just that God has decided to help that person. And when God decides to help a person, protocols are broken. Even the scriptures is suspended. When God decides that he's going to help a person, you know the Bible told us in John chapter 5, that occasionally the water will be troubled. And whenever that water is troubled, anybody who steps into that water will be made whole. No matter the sickness. Whenever God decides to trouble that water, anybody, it has nothing to do with whether you were guilty or you are innocent. Presidential pardon is for anybody, no matter the crime. You may not like it. But I am a candidate for presidential pardon. Yeah. If you are that person, let me hear your big amen. Yeah. I know many of you have been smiling. You know, there have been a lot of issues about presidential pardon. And why God was talking about this matter with me, I was reading in the newspaper. People saying, how can you give pardon to this kind of person? And God said, yes, that is the way I used to do my own thing. It will never make meaning if the person is qualified. Oh, yes. The truth about presidential pardon, which all of us we are looking for from God, is that we are the least qualified for it. And what makes it meaningful is that it is given to the worst person that should receive it. You know the advantage I have over you is that God is my father. <laughs> is that God is my father. So there are some presidential pardon that I keep enjoying. I don't know whether God is also your father. Somebody cannot understand why you should still be favored. But God said I should announce to you today that no matter what anybody feels about you, no matter the evidence anybody has against you, help is on the way from heaven for you. In the name of Jesus Christ. You know, we are gathering on this mountain today as a place of mercy and compassion. We have no business today about our righteousness or our sin. We are just on the mountain of mercy and compassion. The Bible says, 
if the pursuer pursues anybody and he runs into the city of refuge, the pursuer must go back. We are not saying whether he is innocent or guilty. So far, he has gotten to the city of refuge. Every pursuer must just have to turn back. Whatever cannot stop you from coming here today will not stop your help from heaven in the name of Jesus Christ. You are leaving this place today a brand new blessed person in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever evidence the enemy may have against you until this moment, the Bible said he tore every evil handwriting against us. Everything is being torn to pieces in the name of Jesus Christ. Your qualification for help is not you, it is him. They caught that woman in the very heart. I used to like the way they put that very. It's not that somebody told us. They caught her in the very heart of adultery. But the smart guy has escaped. So they did not allow her to wear her clothes oh, before she will start denying. They didn't allow her to wear her clothes. Just stand up from there. Stand up from there. Can I do somebody for example? I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, I would have loved to dramatize this thing. Just stand up. Just. Eh, eh. You know what they ask her to do? Oh, yeah, hold your mouth. And they took her. You know your punishment? Please, I will not do it again. No. They dragged her out. But providentially, as they picked up the stone to stone her, let me read to you. Let me read. At that time, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in their midst. Was it in the temple they caught her? At home. And they were supposed to bring her out and stone her. So they hear that Jesus was in the temple. Please, I want you to understand this story. And they thought that they can use a matter to implicate Jesus. Because this one that we have caught you in, we have evidence. Do you know one of the things that makes the devil to rejoice? When he thinks he has evidence against you. And every time the devil has evidence, it makes a lot of noise. Because it is written in the scriptures that such a woman must be stoned to death. And Jesus has been noted as the lover of our life. They have known him that he is too interested in helping people. So they say, but in this matter, if he tries anything, it will be implicated. And you know that coincidentally that day, Jesus was preaching on thou shalt not commit adultery. In the temple that day was preaching, the theme of the message was thou shalt not do what? So Jesus said, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery and you know the consequences of committing adultery? You shall be stoned to death. So I warn all of you who are still committing adultery, you better watch it. Because if you are caught committing adultery, you are definitely going to be stoned to death. My dear brothers and sisters, stop committing adultery. Because if you are caught in the heart, in the very heart of committing adultery, and then suddenly, <laughs> they brought a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. They said, hey. Uh -huh. She be it is us he was preaching against. Eh? You see, when he was preaching, his eyes was here. <laughs> He's facing us like this. Now they have brought somebody. Let's hear what he's going to say. So he bent down and was writing on the ground. And they continued to ask him, Should we stone this woman or not? You know, as I was reading that gospel reading, I smiled. I smiled because something came to my heart. Then Jesus said, If you have not sinned, be the first to cast the stone at her. But it's not if you have not sinned that made me to laugh. It is the meaning of if you have not sinned. 
Because there is punishment for every sin. If you tell a lie, ten strokes of the cane. If you steal a goat, you will pay back four. But if you commit adultery, you will be what? So I was expecting somebody to say, I know that I have sinned, but the sin I committed is not this time. I know that I have sinned. I cannot say I have not sinned before. I lied. But the punishment for my sin is not like this. We know that all of us are sinners, but we don't commit this type of sin. Do you know why they didn't talk? Do you know the sin they committed? <laughs> Oh, you don't understand. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, if you have not sinned, cast a stone against her. And I was thinking that somebody should say, even if we sin, it is not. <laughs> so do you understand that? The reason why they could not cast that stone was that. You see this particular sin, God, God. <laughs> Before Jesus, we just do like this on the wall. You. 15th of August. <laughs> Everybody will just be watching the thing as it's happening. And do you know from the elders? You know why I start from the elders? Because they have committed it plenty of times. <laughs> you know, the older you are, the, the more sinner you are. From the elders, they started dropping their stone. Because that, if you have not seen, seems like Jesus was saying, if you have not done this thing that you want to kill her for. But this is the message that the Lord is giving us this morning. It's a message to encourage us. It's a message to rebuild our confidence and to understand the way God is working with us. We are pursuing perfection. Be ye perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But the journey of perfection is not our personal journey. It's a journey that we are going with Christ. And he's going with us every single way of that journey. This way is not just our personal journey. That if you have arrived, come and meet me where I am. If you don't arrive, you are finished. No, he's not asking you to go on that journey on your own. In fact, he is the one going on the journey with us. You know, what is interesting about this story is that the scriptures have already said that such a woman should be killed. But providentially, they brought that woman to Jesus. Jesus did not free that woman because everybody has been committing that sin. He freed that woman because that is what he does. He didn't free her because other people have sinned. No. He freed her because that is him. There were some other women that have been killed. And if they had stoned that woman, and Jesus passed that way, and they said, what happened? They said this woman was caught in adultery and was stoned. Jesus would say, okay, ah, may she rest in peace. But this matter was brought to Jesus. So when a matter has been brought to Jesus, it becomes a different matter. No matter how bad a matter is, the only time the enemy has power over that matter is when it didn't get to Jesus. And that is why every time you have an issue, the first thing the devil tries is that that matter should not get to Jesus. He wants you to judge and settle that matter before you get to Jesus. So he made sure that Judas judged himself before the resurrection. Because the devil knows that if that matters of Judas' betrayer finally gets to Jesus in two days' time, it may be a different case. That is why every time you are struggling in your life, the first thing the devil tells you is don't come to church. Because he knows that if you bring that matter to Jesus, help will come from heaven for you. He makes sure that if you used to sit in the front, he wants you to sit at the back where you may lose your concentration. And what the enemy is attempting is that 
you do not carry that stinking matter unto Jesus. And he will present it in such a way as if Jesus does not want to see you. And the first thing the enemy will first show you is where it has been written that a sinner is an abomination unto God. So that when you want to go and meet him, you will say to yourself, I am an abomination. And because you have already concluded, instead of coming to meet him, you will distance yourself away from him. Do you know that when Jesus resurrected, if Judas was still alive, he would have said, go and call him for me. And the devil knew there was no much time. So he said, die, die. This one you are sorry. Which kind of sorry is that? Die. How can you face Jesus? You are an abomination. But you know the truth is that Jesus did not free this woman just because everybody, they've also committed it. No, that was not just the issue. But Jesus was just trying to show that even who are you to judge somebody? When even yourself, you are worse than the person you are judging. But the reason why Jesus freed that woman is because that is Jesus. And that when a matter gets to him, no matter how terrible the matter looks, it becomes a different matter if it finally gets to Jesus. And that is why, no matter the matter, I don't know whether I am talking as a good preacher today, to tell you that in as much as there should not be matter, but the truth is that we will continue to struggle with matter. And I will not tell you that we will not have matter. But where we are going is perfection. But I don't know when I will arrive there. I don't know when you will arrive there. And before you arrive there, you will have issues. And all of us will have to keep dealing with issues over and over again. And it can be very annoying. It can be very discouraging. It can be very besetting. In fact, I was told about one brother in Lagos. He was a very strong, charismatic brother. God was using him, and he was a great preacher. Then they say one day, he just went and committed suicide. And he wrote a note. How can a great child of God like me, a great man of God, commit adultery? It's better I die. He was surprised that he's not God. In as much as we must arrive quickly at the place of perfection. And we must demonstrate to the world the righteousness of Christ that is in us. But I still know that over and over again, we will still struggle with matters. And there are some issues you will keep struggling with. And struggling with, and sometimes you will just ask yourself, am I a child of God? But one thing is that no matter what happens, you must still come to Jesus. You know, the devil knows what he's doing, but he doesn't know what God is doing. I was reading through a story in the book of Numbers. You know, what happened in Numbers when they hired Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. You know the story very well. You know, when he tried cursing them, he was blessing them. That is where we got these scriptures in Numbers 23, 23. There is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. But do you know that if you go to chapter 25, I think, of that Numbers, when they try to curse them and curse them and nothing works, they said there is no way we can curse these people. You know what they did? They said, let us seduce them. Let us send our women into the camp. We know the men. Eh? We know them. We trust them. They will never fail us. And our women will drag them to come and worship idols. And it worked like that. And after that, a lot of the sons of Israel, they died. So the devil himself knew that if he was able to take them through that path, all those protection that God has been giving them, it will now be they versus God. Since the enemies could not overpower them. So they wanted to turn them against God. So that God himself will be the one that will punish them. So it is a strategy of the enemy to want to turn you against God. So that it will no longer be the enemy that is your problem. So that it will be the problem that you are having with God. And by the time you have this consciousness inside you, you know something happens. There is a natural fear. Every time your life is not correct, that God now is against you. Are you with me? Do you know that this woman could not imagine that she could be free? 
Because the person they brought her to is the one that gave them the scripture that anybody caught in adultery should be stoned to death. By the time everybody left, she was left alone with Jesus. Then Jesus asked her, has anybody condemned you? She looked around like this. And all the crowd, they have disappeared. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Do you know why help is coming from you, from heaven? Why God is not interested in condemning you, but is interested in helping you? I want you to note this point very, very well. Because you see, in the journey to destiny, there will be a lot of struggles, a lot of issues, a lot of fighting, a lot of battling. You know the devil fights in rounds. I used to have a prayer book when I was in the seminary. And the author of the prayer book, he wrote a place there. He said, God, why is it that some seasons in my life, I feel like I'm a saint. And some season, we just come in the middle of that season. And I feel like I'm the worst person. He just wrote it there. And do you know why it's like that? Because the devil fights in rounds. And there are times you will think that everything is just perfect and correct. And suddenly, some warfare will come again. And you find yourself struggling. But you must take note of this. That why God has determined that no matter what, he will help you. And that once your case can be at the feet of Jesus, it will receive mercy and grace. And that God has made up his mind that he will help you. That he will help us. And as long as we are still living, we are candidates for the help of God. Number one, maybe you may not know so much that God actually loves us. The Bible says that if you can understand the depth and the weight of the love of God for you, then you will just be like God himself. The book of Lamentations 3.22 The steadfast love of the Lord, you know it very well, never ceases. And his mercies never comes to an end. Never forget that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The devil said it is written. Jesus said it is written. The devil said to Jesus, it is written. Jesus replied him, it is also written. And it is written that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And his mercy never comes to an end. Where do you know that the soul that sinner shall die? Where do you know? Who told you? Where do you know that? It is written. Is it not? It is written. You would not have had the concept of what is wrong. You would not have had the concept of what God does not like. If not that we saw it in the Bible. And it is also written that the steadfast love of the Lord, steadfast love, never ceases. And his mercy never comes to an end. So, it is a matter of believing. But what makes you sad is what is written. And what will make you happy is also what... You get me, sister? Anything that will kill my confidence in God now will be something that I know that it is written, that it is wrong. And I say, oh... And the devil say, oh... But it is also written... That he has loved me with an everlasting love. And that his mercy upon my life. I didn't write it. He knows why he wrote it. But I'm going to believe him for it. That his mercies for me, they will never come to an end. Are you with me? Is God blessing somebody this morning? See, that's where we are going. To the place of the ultimate calling of God in our life. But no matter what we have to struggle with and happens in the course of the journey, you must never stop believing that God loves you. And it is not that you are forming it that he loves you. He also wrote it that his love will never come to an end and his mercy never ends. Let us open to Romans chapter 8, verse 31, following. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, 
who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he can give Jesus to die for us, he can give us some things. Is that what we read? He can give us what? All things. All things. Freely. He can also freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Number two. The ministry that Jesus is doing now is the ministry of interceding for you. I want you to understand that despite the fact that you are praying, Jesus is actually interceding also for you. So how can he be praying for you and he will wish that you will fail? You see, when you are failed, it is not just only you, but he is also your intercessor. Number one, God loves us. Number two, Jesus is actually interceding for us. The Bible says, is it God that justifies now, that sends somebody to die? He said, that is not even all. Is it Jesus now, the one that is living there in heaven, praying for Father Domingo, praying, praying. Is it the one that is praying for me? Imagine a woman, sells all her property, sells everything. The child says, I want to travel out. To go to school abroad. She says everything. From her own apartment. She moved to a rented apartment. One room. So that the son will travel. Then the woman comes to church and starts praying. Lord do not allow them to give that child visa. Is it possible? Is it the one. That sold everything. Sold his life. And is praying for your success. That will now see opportunity to rescue you. Then he will now counter. After the woman sold everything all her life. For her son. Then she will now come to church and pray that God, please, let everything fail. You don't understand. God has invested so much. Jesus has invested. He will never allow his investment. He invested his life so that you will succeed. And after resurrecting, he is there investing all his energy for your success. Is it the one that will now refuse to help you? Help is on the way for you. Let me finish that scripture. I love it so much. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our... Nothing. Not even where I'm standing today. Whether I'm standing up, whether I'm standing in the depths, can separate me from the love. Not only that he has invested, he's still investing in my life. His prayer. He told him, he said, Peter, I have prayed for you. Even if you deny me, eh, you will recover. You will recover. Because I'm the one investing my prayer. God is investing prayer. After investing his life, Jesus is still investing. You don't know. You think you are the only one praying. He's investing prayer into my life. He's investing prayer. Jesus is actually also praying for you. You're not the only one praying for yourself. So it is not that same Jesus. They will not bring your matter to he will say, no, let her die. The one that invested his life, it's an opportunity. If they kill you before you get to him, it's another matter. But if you get to him, the same person, imagine that that's your mother that sold everything. They say, come and decide among all these children who we should give visa. The woman that sold all her property, they say, come and choose who we should give. They just saw her on the street. They say, come woman, you are the one that will choose somebody. Eh? <laughs> you know what she will do? The same woman. That is why the devil does not want you to get to Jesus. Because he knows that Jesus is even praying for you. So he knows that the one that is praying for you will not be against you. You know these spiritual things 
many of us don't actually understand what is happening in heaven. Some of us think that we are just on our own. You know, some people think that when the devil is tempting them, God will stand there and say, okay, oh. <laughs> lie. Lie now. And immediately you lie. You don't know that even that time, when you are under pressure, Jesus is doing like this. No, Father, help him. God, help him. Help him. You think that he's standing somewhere and looking for when you will do something wrong, then he will slap you. No. That is not the position God takes in our struggle. He takes the position of a helper. Number three, I want you to know that there is help for you from heaven. Because God wants the devil to fail. See, there is nothing the devil can do to God. Nothing. If devil wants to take his own pound of the flesh from God, he can only take it from us. Because we are God's children and we are created in his image and likeness. Devil knows he cannot do anything, but it's okay if he can get Father Domingo. It's okay. That's the only thing he wants. He cannot get God. Yoruba people, they have a proverb that if a chicken should pour my medicine away, I will break the egg. If a chicken should go, my juju, and he pours it away, no problem. I will go to where he lays his eggs, and I will break all of them. And then it's okay. All of us have lost. Do you know that? The devil knows that you are a child of God. And he knows that he cannot do God anything. So, God wants the devil to fail. The only success the devil is looking for is how to kill your destiny and make a mess of your life. There is nothing else he can achieve. He is already condemned. He has lost everything. The devil is not achieving anything with his demons. They are all condemned together. The only way he's going to at least say, yes, myself, I did my own back to God, is what he will do against me or you. And because God wants the devil to go empty-handed, he decides that he will help us. You know, God has sworn to help me so that the devil will go empty-handed. I have found David my servant, and with my holy oil I have anointed him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. Even if his sons, they should sin against me, I will flood them, but I will not break my covenant with David. Once and for all, I have sworn, by my own name, I swear, I will not break my covenant with David, no matter what the devil does. The only way the devil becomes a loser is when he loses in our life. And the only way the devil wins anything is when he wins in our life. So God wants the devil to go empty-handed. So because of this, he has positioned himself to do what? To help us. Number four. Open to Ephesians chapter two. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We are actually predestined for success. We have been destined for the throne. Do you know that woman that committed adultery? She has been destined for success. But she struggled for some time in her life. But do you know she ended the success? The Bible said when Enoch was 65, he walked with God. I said what happened before he was 65? God said, mind your business. When Enoch was 65, he walked with God to the extent that God took him life to heaven. God just came to pick him. Let's go to heaven. They were just playing around one day and God picked him. But the Bible said when Enoch was 65, he walked with God. He struggled for 64 years. But he kept believing God's help. And he kept praying. He kept walking with God. And when he was 65, he got there. And by the time he died, God took him. When you hear that God took Enoch like that, you will think that all his life has been like that. That story, that good story of Enoch, started at 65 years. We have all been predestined for success. We have been predestined for the throne. Immediately you become a child of God. Your name is in the book of life. In fact, somebody was saying something, and I noted it, that there is no way in the Bible that a child of God, you are told your name will be written. What the Bible says is that your name is there. It's only that when people don't make heaven, their names are blotted out. 
but it's not that their names will be written. Immediately you become a child of God. Your name is registered. I baptize you, eh, Michael, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and is written. I baptize you, Judas, in the name of the Father. But when Judas did not make heaven, they removed the name. They erased it. Every one of us here, our names is already there. It's not that our names will be written in the book of life. Our names already in the book of life. Written in the book of life. We are already destined for success. God is not planning that you will fail. He has destined all of us for success. He said, none that you gave to me will be lost. Apart from the son of perdition, that refused to wait for me to judge him, that judge himself. That refused to still continue at the feet of Jesus. Who lost hope in what Jesus can do for him. Apart from him, everyone's name. Jesus told the twelve, rejoice because your name is written where? Even Judas' name was written in the book of life. It was just that he didn't wait for Jesus. And by the time he committed suicide, they just removed the name. The name was just erased. But it was written there before. So your name is not going to be written in the book of success. So your name is already written in the book of success. And it will never be blotted out in the name of Jesus Christ. Because I know you will continue to follow him. I know he will continue to be your friend. I don't know whether God is blessing somebody this morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never sees it. And his mercies never come to an end. You know, that is our portion in Christ Jesus as God's children. You remember what happened last Sunday when the prodigal son returned home? What interests me in that story was what God, what the father did for that boy. It was a very interesting thing. You know what he did? When the boy returned home, you know, as the boy was even coming, I'm sure he met at the gates of their city. He met some of the servants there. They look at him like this. You know, it was a failure. It was already messed up. Everything about his life was messed up. So they look at him like this. One of the people he met at the gate that day was the one that used to polish his shoe. The one that used to carry his bag was there. But you know, when you are messed up, when something has happened in your life, even the people that respect you before, they don't respect you again. You know, everybody takes advantage. When you make a mistake, everybody takes advantage. And they mess you up very well. And when you say, please, you say, what? I better get away. So that was the way they were treating him. So when his father saw him from far, can I continue? Do you know that it was his father that ran to him? And when the father was coming, so many things were in his mind. He will slap me. You know, as the father was running, some of the servants were running with him. And some of them think that they were going to beat the boy. So when they were going, they were going like this. You know, there are times, eh? Some people, when they have seen your downfall, they will be coming with blow because they are expecting that God was also going to blow you. But do you know, they will be shocked. Somebody is going to be shocked about your life. They have already carried their blow because that is what they are expecting from God for you. And they will be surprised that it is an embrace. So when they were coming like this behind, some of them carry stick on the road. They will use that. The father is annoyed. That What is this boy? They have never seen their father run like that. That what is this boy coming to do here? So they carry stick. They carry dagger. So we will beat hell out of him. Then they just saw the father embrace his son. As dirty as he was. This was a boy that wanted to eat the food of the pigs. And they gave him close marking. That was the frustration that brought him. The pigs gave him close marking. So he said, even ah, pigs, you know what pigs eat? Even if pigs will treat me like this, let me go back home. He just carried his bag. But do you know what the father did? That interests me so much. He said, put a new robe on him. Do you know what he now did? He now said, go and bring that my ring. You know the father has one ring. So the father took that ring. He knew that the boy has been messed up. And nobody will ever respect him again. So he put the ring in his hand. He gave him a position that was even higher than the position before he left. So that if anybody thinks they can mess up with this boy, look at his hand. He's wearing the ring of authority. So immediately they gave him the ring. Anybody that saw him, my Lord, he gave him that ring. Put a new sandal on his feet. So everybody started pretending back. But that one does not matter. So far, you will kneel down and do what? So you know what the father did? He knew that there was a shame in his life. You know the children of Israel, though they have left Egypt, but the shame of Egypt was still on them. 
So you know what the father did? He gave him a glory. Eh? That when you see the glory, you can never remember the shame. When the devil did this to Jesus, it was so that he will never be able to raise his head in the public again. He said, so naked him publicly. Anywhere you are passing, you will see him hanging naked on the cross with blood. But do you know that? God gave him a name above all names. That after God exalted him, on Good Friday now, we will be struggling to kiss what the devil meant for his shame. And now in our churches, we put the crucifix. The devil is shocked. When he organized this thing, it was for shame. But God now gave a glory that what was actually meant for your shame is now what is being celebrated. Come on, clap for Jesus. Because that's what God is doing in your life. That is your story. That is your story. That is your story. That is my story. That is your story. Number five, Isaiah 41. Let's read from verse 14. I don't know whether God is blessing somebody this morning. Fear not, you warm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sled with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small. And make the eels like chaff. You shall winnow them and the wind shall carry them away. And the wind, wind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. Fear not, you worm. See, God knows that you are a worm. He knows. God is not shocked by anything. He knows of what substance we are created. I am just, but what? But the worm. You know, God has decided that he will help us. Because he knows of what we are made. He knows that we are just warm. All of us are just struggling. We are just trying and struggling and struggling. Sometimes he will just be laughing. We just, he says, see, before the cock will cry, you will betray me. He says, no, Lord, I cannot betray you. After I finish betraying him, he look at him like him. The next day, he appeared to them. When they got to the tomb and they didn't see him, you know what he told that woman? He said, go and tell Peter, your head. Peter said, did he call my name? Because the last encounter they had was the betrayer. He said, he said I should tell Peter. There is Peter that should inform others. Peter said, he called my name. Or he said, go and tell everybody. He said, no, he said, I should inform you. There is anything you say, others must follow. He said, me. Peter said, Cry. Because the last time we met was the time I denied him. So you mean my position is still for me? But I thought that he would give it to the ones that didn't betray him. But he still said, go and tell Peter. So when Jesus appeared there, when they were gathered in the room, immediately Jesus appeared, peace be with you, he sat down. As he sat down like this, he just called and said, Peter, what are you doing there? Come on, sit down. So my dear children, I have come. Anyway, I don't have much, but anyway, Peter will be telling you every other thing. Peter was surprised. So it was that time Peter now said, you know, brothers, as the Lord has told me, you know, I, I want to inform all of you. <laughs> it was because Jesus, eh, he lifted him up. God knows that we are one. He himself said it. And not only one. See the way he put it. Fear not. You warm Jacob. You know Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and He said, Jacob, you are a worm. A worm. But I, I will do what? I will help you. Can you see it? From what you have heard, that God loves you. That Jesus is even the one that is praying for you now, now. That God actually wants the devil to go empty-handed. The devil is saying we will divide the spoil. You will take some and take some. God said you will not take anyone in this account. They might get. So Jesus and him, they are combating. Say you will not take anything. And God said in the first reading, can you see it? Can you see something new breaking forth? Can you see it? I do something new. It was in the desert. Even the jackers, the donkeys, they will rejoice. How much more you? It's not because of them we created the rivers, oh. 
but they will be rejoicing. That thank God for that Domingo is here. He's in this wilderness. Look at how God created water now. They say, God, we thank you for Father Domingo. And you that God is creating the water for you are down. When even the animals are enjoying blessing that is because of you, they are rejoicing. I'm telling you, there are some people they will be enjoying because of you. He said even the wild animals will be rejoicing. They will be happy. He said, can't you see it? That something new is happening in your life. Can't you see it? That there is help for you in heaven. You have been down. You have been condemning yourself and you have been in this situation because you cannot see that there is help for you from heaven. But can you see it now? It's not a different story from those of our fathers in faith. Paul said, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth today. I will not lie. It is not that I have been perfected though. I am still struggling. Let me cuckoo tell you the truth. Because some of you that are even discouraged, you are even better than me. But you see, there is one thing I know. And that is the thing that you have here this morning. And because of what I have here this morning, one thing I do, this one thing I always do, I leave yesterday behind. He said immediately I hear this same message. One thing I do, don't think that I have been perfected though. I am far from it. But one thing I do, I forget about that one that happened yesterday. I forget about that that happened yesterday. You can open it in your Bible. Philippians. Philippians 3. You know, because after everything that God has said to us, it's the same word that all those who make it with God, they heard. But it is what you do after hearing this word that will now matter. What you do after hearing this word, it matters so. It's the same word all those people that made it, they heard. But what you do after hearing it, from verse 12, he said, Not that I have already attained, or I am already perfected. He said, I will not lie to you. I have not attained, and I'm not already perfected. I still struggle. I struggle. You know, I, Paul, I was the one that told you, I told you, that anybody that is in God must never sin. But I'm not saying that I'm perfected. Though. Even brother John told you the same thing. But it's not that he's perfected. But I don't even know about John. Don't let me put him out in his matter. Paul said. But for myself, that wrote almost everything in the New Testament. As of today as I'm talking to you, I have not attained and I'm not yet perfected. Don't let me put him out in other people's matter. So that I won't look like I'm criticizing them. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Since Jesus has chosen me as his child. Since he has laid hold of me. That thing he said he will make me. It will happen in my life. And so, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. No. No. I will not lie to you. I am not yet there. No. But one thing I do, one thing I do, there's one thing that has kept me going all these years. You know what I do that has kept me going? Forgetting those things which are behind, I forget about yesterday. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I forget about all those yesterday's issues. And I'm looking forward to what is still ahead of me. What God says he will make of my life. I'm still looking forward to it. And I forget about those issues of yesterday. And when you see me praying, when you see me believing God, when you see me confessing my destiny, when you see me confessing greatness, you will think that it has been a smooth road for me. But one thing I just do is that I forget about that yesterday. And I continue to confess and profess and pursue what God showed me from the beginning. Though from that beginning, there have been issues in my life. But I leave those issues behind. And I continue to confess. I continue to lay hold. I continue to pursue that that is ahead of me. And you know what I love most? He said, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love that verse 15. He said, therefore, let us as many as are mature, 
have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. He said, anybody that is mature, this is the way he must think. He said, but if anybody think otherwise, that no, no. How can you just be telling people that they should continue to pursue? Yesterday is what will determine your tomorrow. He said, if anybody think otherwise, pray about it. He said, but I am sure this thing I have preached today is what God will finally come and say. He said, what I have said today, if you pray about it, is what you will still end up with. Jesus, my Lord, to thee I cry, unless thou help me, I must die. Oh, take thy free. Let us rise on our feet. Vision out and take me as I am. We are going to pray with the wordings of this song this morning. The first verse says, Jesus, my Lord, to thee I cry. Unless thou help me, I will die. The enemy will overtake me. The enemy will mock me. The enemy will win me. The enemy will laugh over me. I want you to pray this morning. Lord Jesus, I want you to help me. I know that you have said that there is help for me from above. I want you to help me. Because if you don't help me, oh, I will die. If you don't help me, I will fail. If you don't help me, the enemy will rejoice over me. Lord, help me this morning. I want your help to come for me from above. I want help from above. Help me, Lord. Because if you don't help me, I will die. If you don't help me, I will fail. If you don't help me, there is nothing that can happen in my life. I want you to talk to God. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we cry for your help. We cry for your help. We cry for your help. Unless thou help me, I will die. Unless you help me, I will die. I don't have any strength of my own. I am just a worm, oh Lord. I am just a worm. Come and help me. Come and help me, oh God. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Unless thou help me, oh Lord, I will die. Oh, I want you to talk to God this morning. Tell him you are just but a worm. Unless he helps you, you cannot get to your destination. Unless he helps you, you cannot make it to the finish. But I want you to help me. I want you to help me. Help me, O oh God. You help Israel, your servant. Help me, O oh God. I am not different from my fathers. I am not different from my fathers. I am just a worm like that. O oh God, I want you to help me. I want you to help me. Oh God, take me as I am. And just help me. Oh, come and help me, oh God. Help me, oh God. Help me, oh God. I am a righteous sinner. I am full of iniquity. I am full of guilt. But you know everything. But you died for me. You know my condition. And you decided to die for me. And I know you can help me. You can help me if thou wait. Please help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Talk to God, talk to God, talk to God. There is no preparation I can make. Even my best resolve, I'm always breaking them. Lord, I have been breaking all my promises to you. How many times I have breaking my promises to you? But because of your name, save me for your name's sake. Save me for your name's sake. Even my best resolve, I have always broken them. But for your name's sake, oh, let us kneel down, let us kneel down, let us kneel down, let us kneel down. Choir, you can continue with the preaching. Listen to the last answer. Behold me, Savior, at thy feet. Deal with me as thou seest me. Thy work begin, thy work completes. Behold me, Savior, at thy feet. This is how I am. I'm just like this. I'm no more than this. Deal with me just this way I am. 
the work that you have started in my life, come and bring it to this completion. And just take me as I am. Oh God, finish your work, finish your work. Finish your work, finish your work, finish your work. Finish your work, finish your work, finish your work. Oh my God, in Jesus' precious name we pray. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Listen to me, listen to me. Please listen to me. I want quiet, 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 quiet. Listen to me, listen to me. I want us to know what we are doing here this morning. Because I see God doing something great in your life. You know Paul said, I have not apprehended. But when you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, listen to what Paul said. After he finished this prayer, look at the way Paul that said, he's not perfected. He has not apprehended. He's far from his destiny. Look at what he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. One day, the same Paul that said, I am not perfected. I am still struggling. He said today, the same Paul now said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Now I can tell you that I have finished. The same Paul. He said, I have kept the faith. But that was the Paul that said, I have not before. The last verse of that song says, the work you have started, you will perfect it for me. We are going to pray one more time. That God, Behold me at thy feet. Deal with me as thou seest me. I'm no more than this. I cannot do better than like this unless thou help me. Thy work begin. You started this work. I didn't come to know you myself. You gave me the Holy Spirit who led me to you. Thy work begin. Thy work come and complete. And take me as I am. I want you to talk to God this morning. I want you to pray this prayer from the depths of your hearts. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. You can rise on your feet. Just thank him and lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Just lift up your hands and thank the Lord. Just give him glory. And the word of the Lord says, I do something new. I do something new. I do something new. Just lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Give him glory. Thus saith the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariots and oars, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wig. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Just lift up your hands and be praising him. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me. The jackals and the ostriches. For I will give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I have found for myself, that they might declare my praise. Just lift up your hands and bless him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you. Just lift up your hands and praise him. Something new has happened in our life from this moment. It's a new blessing, glory, honor, power. Something new, something new, something new. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.